The city of Shi He sat among the final string of hills on the border of the Great Western Plain. It was Queen Zheng Zhang's base of operations, and hence had attracted the attention of Emperor Liu Bei. At the close of summer in 197, elite imperial troops scaled the walls during the night and threw open the gates. The emperor was disappointed with what he met inside. The bandit queen was nowhere to be found. Still, he would not go a single evening without a prestigious guest, for a pair of bedraggled travellers hiked up from the Yellow River at dusk. When their names were reported to Liu Bei, it was beyond belief. The emperor went out to see the pair for himself. One wore a simple traveller's tunic, but the taller wore burgundy plate armour with a fine tiger fur draped over the shoulders. He held in his hand a dragon of crafted jade, dull in the torchlight. It was offered to and accepted by the emperor, and that is how Sun Tzu, emperor of Wu, rendered his submission. It was always said that the great house of Sun valued results over prestige, Liu Bei said. With this act, Lord Sun, you have proven that a thousandfold. The Southlands will sing your praises as highly as your great ancestor Sun Tzu. At this, Sun Tzu burst into tears and could not be convinced to relent, let alone eat or drink. His seat of honour at the great feast that evening was taken instead by the Jade Dragon, the seal of his kingly power. Beside it sat Lu Su, Wu's lead strategist. He spoke well, but always seemed to glare when Zhuge Liang proposed a toast. Eventually, the Prime Minister invited him outside and said, You are well known on the scholarly scene, Lu Su. Surely you have no reason to doubt your judgment this day. What do you mean, Prime Minister? Lu Su replied. Correct me if I am wrong, but was this course of events not your scheme? You might be made Lord of all the Southlands for this great deed. Prime Minister, I have been holding back, but since you are prying, I will tell you. To reach you, we travelled the Yangtze, through Jing, through the capital districts and along the Yellow River. Was there a single day when we were not looked upon by hungry eyes, by bandits, by constables with pockets as thirsty as the sky? Were it not for the heroic bearing of my lord, we surely would have met a foul end. This is your empire. What carelessness allows you, a famous scholar yourself, to claim to be prime minister of this charade? Master Lu, were all in this empire as honest as you, we would forever be at peace, Zhuge Liang laughed. But surely you learned the basics of alchemy. We are on the point of preparing our ingredients. When I begin to mix, the nature of the blend can bear no resemblance to its base at all. And but a boy dares lecture me. You should take my head now, for the likes of I will only cause you trouble in the future. I'm counting on it, Master Lu, Zhuge Liang said, taking his leave. Lu Su looked up at the stars and said, How can a man believe that all the stars transit around him? How can a man believe anything else? Great understanding and great ambition, the left and right eyes of the dragon. Did they open too soon? or too late. Sun Tzu and Lu Su were given a substantial collection of fine treasures and a large troop of bodyguards, then sent to reside at the main court in Donghai. In the meantime, Liu Bei's officials flooded into the Southlands and took control of the commandery and county administrations of Wu. The Kingdom of Wu effectively ceased to exist, and the civil war in the south was over. The fanfare and celebrations for those in the pro-Liu faction were amplified by news of the Northern Civil War, in which Zhang Fei and Zhang Chao had captured two of Gongsun Zan's cities. More triumphs would follow. Zhang Chao advanced to the walls of Zhongshan, where he was met by a resurgent Yuan Shu. Indeed, self-styled Emperor Zhang was not caught amid the crumbling of his realm, and now the King of Yan was revealed to be not only a pretender himself, but an abetter to a pretender also. No cleaner condemnation of Gongsun Zan's scheme was needed for the loyal subjects of the mandated Emperor Dongfang. Yuan Shu was soundly defeated in brief engagements and scurried north to his king in the city of Dai. Zhang Fei arrived in the days following this rout, and the fate of Zhang Shan seemed sealed. However, before an attack was made, Yan banners approached again. A large army travelled down from Dai, 
waving banners that read, The Worthy of the New Era. This was the Imperial Army of Yan, led by Qin Wen Meng, a commandant of the old capital district around Luoyang. This old guard general had no second thoughts about challenging Zhang Fei for single combat, no matter his fearsome reputation. Seeing the challenge, Zhang Fei roared and charged out alone. Delighted, Qin Wen Meng ordered her army to attack at once, then drew her blade to do her part. With a single swipe, she sent Zhang Fei tumbling from his horse, then jumped down to grapple with the enraged beast in the mud. In this way, she denied the Liu army its general at the very moment her troops were attacking. But alas, this scheme was predicated on a critical misunderstanding. Zhang Fei was not the director of his army. Intolerant of reading and unreflective in victory, Zhang Fei knew little of battlecraft despite his vast experience witnessing it. Therefore, it was Chu Shu whom the army runners reported to, and he responded to the Yan scheme calmly. The front ranks were narrowed and deepened to buy more time, and Huang Gai drew up in front with a huge battle axe, inflicting cloying nerves upon the charging men. Additionally, the Yan army had lacked for horses ever since Gong Sun Zan's pointed sacrifice at Ye, and so was quickly surrounded by the Liu riders advancing on the wings. With these two measures, the Yan vanguard floundered and their rear was imperiled. Qin Wan Ming's gambit had failed, and once Zhang Fei struggled away and recovered his serpent spear, she was slain with a single thrust. All round, troops were scattered away from the Liu cavalry, and the battle seemed lost. However, the vanguard knew nothing of this and pressed into the Liu formation with high hopes. A Yan officer from the rear rode forward to order a retreat, but a volley of arrows struck he and horse down. By the time those engaged in the fighting realized what was going on behind them, it was too late. The Liu troops surrounded them, while catapults and riders massacred those already fleeing. Zhang Fei and Huang Gai were like whirlwinds, slaying Yan men by the dozen. Following their example, the Liu soldiers completed the task with great enthusiasm. The counterattack had been crushed, and Zhong Shan surrendered shortly after. Zhang Chao secured the rich lands and food stores across the rest of the commandery. This cut the supply of food to Dai City, only a week's march north of Zhongshan. The fall of the Pretender was in sight, but Liu Bei ordered a halt to the advance on account of a strange matter. Back in Shi He, Liu Bei had exerted great efforts investigating the whereabouts of Zheng Jiang. No answer was found, but he discovered that her husband, Wu Jing, had been sent away from the mountains the previous year. Records from the capital brought up two mentions of his name. In the first, he was named as the Secretary Adjutant of the Pengcheng Temple District under Governor Gao Ding. In the second, only a month old, he was noted as being Quartermaster of Ba, a post in Shu under Governor Yu Minshang. For the husband of a bandit queen to hold two seemingly unrelated posts in Liu Bei's government was notable. To the Emperor, it was more than that. This scoundrel is clearly posing as an appointed official in order to supply the bandits with information, he claimed to his entourage. That is why Queen Zheng continues to elude us. He must be punished. Brother, shall we inquire with Lord Gao and Lady Yu, Guan Yu said. It is possible they really did appoint this man. And if so, their relation to any betrayal must be established. Quite right, brother. These twines of corruption will lead us right to the Queen. Your Majesty, if we accuse our vassals wrongly, they will feel outcast. How will they trust you then? Let us send a man of our own to learn more about this Wu Jing, Zhuge Liang suggested. Did you not hear? He is married to Queen Zheng. How can his movements be innocent? Send to Lady Yu at once. She is to surrender her seal and accept new appointments in Ba Shu according to the Prime Minister's judgment, and order that Wu Jing be brought to me. These orders led to the dissolution of the Yu clan and the spreading of doubt among the other vassal clans of House Liu. Seeing as House Liu was the primary beneficiary of the reallocation of fiefs, there was much talk of betrayal of the highest order. Yet Liu Bei's reputation begot him great trust among the people, who maintained that whatever crimes the Yu clan was accused of, they were surely guilty. Shortly after, Wu Jing was presented to Liu Bei in Shi He. His forehead scarcely left the ground, 
and his shaken voice was almost unintelligible. Your Majesty, what do you intend to do with this man? Zhuge Liang asked Liu Bei. For his crimes, there is only one recourse, execution. How else can we show the realm that we are watching for and eliminating corruption? A noble intent. However, just because you have found a man staying at an inn, you cannot know which direction he was traveling prior, or which direction he will travel in the morning. We must ascertain the facts of the matter. A disloyal man will permit no facts to stand. Perhaps leisurely scholars can waste their time with such games, but we must achieve great things. Forget his story, whatever it may be. It is his spirit that holds his righteousness. And in times of war, the spirit can be tested clearly. I will give him a great responsibility and observe his performance. In his position, a loyal man will succeed at all costs. Your Majesty, your wisdom humbles me, Zhuge Liang conceded. Thus Wu Jing was given a test, an assignment of vital importance. He was to lead the vanguard against Gong Sun Zan. Having some military experience, Wu Jing took to the task eagerly. Was his eagerness a cover for his true intent, or was it gratitude towards his emperor? While the high official speculated, Liu Bei wrote a letter to Zhang Fei and had Guan Yu personally deliver it. After a happy reunion for the two brothers in Zhongshan, Guan Yu showed Zhang Fei the letter. Brothers gone mad! Zhang Fei shouted without hesitation. Guan Yu hastily dismissed the servants, then said, It seems his obsession with the bandit has got the better of him, but if you're thinking of forsaking your oath for a nobody like Wu Jing, then your villainy will be remembered more clearly than that of Gong Sun Zan and Sun Se combined. Why are you saying this? I'll do whatever brother wants. Who cares about that rat Wu Jing? I just thought Elder Brother didn't have the guts to pull a stunt like this. The mantle of Emperor is high, but Elder Brother ascends like a phoenix towards heaven. Ah, you've spent too long with that bookworm, brother. Come on, another round of wine. Amid the drinking, Zhang Fei sent out runners with orders for all of his commanders, including newly arrived Wu Jing. North of Zhangshan, another Yan army had been assembled and stood on the path of advance towards Dai. Wu Jing accepted the task of breaking through with apparent enthusiasm. He was given 1,000 men, and 3,000 more under Zheng Chao were promised. Wasting no time, Wu Jing rode out onto the snow-covered plains outside the Yan camp and challenged for battle. As the Yan force assembled, he thought, If I best one of their champions, I will have truly proven myself. I won't get this chance again, so I cannot fail. With this, he rode off ahead of his army to close in with the foe. As he did, however, the officers Zhang Fei had given orders to quietly halted. Keeping the horns silent and the banners in good order, the army began withdrawing to the city. Zhang Chao, following orders to patrol towns in the countryside, did not even know this offensive was taking place. Therefore, it was only Wu Jing and no more than 40 riders who raced up to face down the Yan army. Wielding a simple spear, he waved out a challenge for battle. Yuan Yao, son of Yuan Shu and would-be imperial prince, emerged with a short halberd in each hand. His sister, Yuan Anyang, brought the army closer to witness the duel and cheer for their fighter. Wu Jing had no such support. The two battled for 30 bouts, each wounding the other several times. However, Wu Jing had caught on that his army was no longer approaching. At this he faltered, and after three more bouts, Yuan Yao slashed out with his twin halberds, striking to the left and right at once, cutting Wu Jing's hands cleanly from his arms. Still holding the spear, they tumbled to the ground. Wu Jing's blood painted the snow at his feet, and within moments he too fell. Yuan Yao survived his wounds after being pulled back to camp, but Wu Jing was left where he fell, by both sides. In this way, Wu Jing was, according to Liu Bei's subsequent proclamation, absolved of his crimes. Zheng Zhang had heard of Wu Jing's summons, but not his demise, and raced to see the emperor. That old man thought he could make a name for himself in the empire. Since I was allied to you, I let him serve in your ranks as he wished, Zheng Zhang said. I heard you suspect him of foul play. Worry not. It is he who suspected me and quit my house without proper proceedings. I would like to have him back so that our marriage might be undone according to heavenly law. Liu Bei laughed and said, 
If that was your intention, then heaven has granted you a great boon. Allow me to show you a gift my younger brother sent me just yesterday. A lacquered box was produced by an attendant. Liu Bei tilted it towards Zheng Zhang and opened it after a savoring delay. Inside was Wu Jing's head, his skin like boiling water suddenly turned to ice. Zheng Zhang gave no reaction, her stare even and her breathing slow. Liu Bei appeared to be waiting for her to say something, but she was not forthcoming. Eventually, the emperor returned the box to a servant. This marriage that concerns you so has been dealt with, he said. How did you do it? Zheng Zhang said. I did nothing. It was the traitor Gongsun who killed him, after I promoted him most highly on account of his noble association with you. Then how did you come upon his head? That was the work of my younger brother. I have no notion of what deeds he performed to recover it, but he knows what it's worth to you. Perhaps you will join me in a letter of thanks. Can the drunkard Zhang even read? My queen, whatever you have heard about my brother, I assure you it's untrue. You will learn otherwise in time. I wonder. Your Majesty, I dare not waste your time speaking to bandits. Your court must be tired of this already. Let us resume our posts. Wait, Lady Zheng. You have forgotten the most crucial fact of the matter. Now that you are without husband, you will be in want of one. I, a humble man given great responsibility, have long admired your passion, strength and loyalty to the House of Han. In fact, even in our brief meetings over the years, you have brought me more joy than any of my concubines. Given this, I would be willing to allow you into my household, if you would be pleased by it. Zheng Zhang stood, a great offence in itself, and spat on the stair before Liu Bei's command chair. Liu Bei, you long-eared mat weaver! I am loyal to my people, and they were loyal to Emperor Shan. Since you have done away with him, they have only me, and I have only them. We look out for each other, because the likes of you can only be our enemies. What right have the people to starve and you to rule? This empire is like a dance performed in driving rain. Our solace from misery, yet ensnaring, and thus the cause of that misery. I would rather eat my children and rip out my innards than be your concubine. Order it of me and I will do it, because when I speak, I speak true. Order me to render myself at this instant, Emperor, or never presume to command my people again. This performance left Liu Bei speechless. Guards moved up to do whatever he bid, but he could bid nothing. He left the room without a word. Zhuge Liang, the highest official, bowed to Zheng Zhang and said, I cannot repay you, Lady Zhang. Go, and I will see that our lord keeps to your wishes. Lady Zhang nodded to the Prime Minister and took her leave. Zhuge Liang smiled and left to see if Liu Bei was affected by all this as he had predicted. Indeed, Liu Bei was distraught. His attempts to avoid tears were failing, and he dismissed Zhuge Liang over and over, but the Prime Minister would not leave the Emperor's chamber. Eventually, Liu Bei calmed down. I wanted to believe she was an honest woman. I wanted to be wrong about her lies, but it was all true. And now Wu Jing is dead, and the Lords are up in arms over this whole affair. Who knew that on the verge of victory, heaven would cast me so low, he moaned. Your Majesty, is it the case that you do not understand Lady Zheng's apprehensions? Zhuge Liang said. Not at all. If she were not a bandit but my empress, how could she claim the Empire was ensnaring her in misery? She is a rogue even to herself. Your Majesty, Lord Liu Bei, the lady plays a most important role in your life. She is the deepest of the five gates to heaven. Would you like me to explain it? Liu Bei wiped his eyes and gave a gentle nod. What was the nature of Zhuge Liang's counsel? Read on.